A phantom cat secretively stalks the remnants of thick, thorny brush in southernmost Texas. Biologists estimate there are less than 50 rare ocelots clinging to a precarious existence in the chaparral of deep south Texas. The last foothold of this strikingly beautiful cat in the United States are two small breeding populations on remote ranch lands in Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. This semi-tropical tip of Texas is known as the Rio Grande Valley. Here, where the Rio Grande meanders between Mexico and the U.S., private landowners are working with state and federal agencies to save the endangered ocelot. Ocelots resemble small jaguars with golden brown fur and long, elegant tails. They are adorned with an array of black spots and stripes, creating an oscillated pattern. These eye-like markings give the cat its name and help camouflage it in its native habitat of almost impenetrable brush. They rarely stray far from their sanctuary in dense thickets and are primarily nocturnal, stalking the night for birds, snakes, and rodents. Very few people ever glimpse one, even those who live and work on lands where they exist. In Mexico, where there are larger populations of ocelots on secluded ranches, the cat is known as tigrillo, or little tiger. They are about twice the length of a domestic cat, with males weighing 20 plus pounds and females slightly less. The historic range of the ocelot once included most of Texas and portions of Arizona, Arkansas, and Louisiana, but habitat loss has left the cats with very little of the dense cover they require. Even in their last stronghold in deep south Texas, more than 95% of the native habitat has been cleared for agriculture and urbanization. Less than 70 years ago, the ocelot shared the south Texas wildlands with the jaguar. The last two jaguars killed in the state were taken in south Texas. One was killed near Kingsville in 1948, and two years before, a jaguar was shot near Omito, not far from the Rio Grande. Another small cat, the Jagarundi, was last positively identified as a roadkill on Boca Chica Highway in 1986. Occasional reports of Jagarundi occur, but no one has photographed or found one dead in some 27 years. Mountain lions still stalk the wildlands of Texas and other western states, while bobcats remain the most common wildcats in the country. The last population of ocelots in the United States clings to their tenuous existence in one of the most biologically diverse regions in the nation. Southernmost Texas is home to over 700 vertebrate creatures, including 523 species of birds, more than 330 kinds of butterflies, and an astonishing 1,200 types of plants. Dr. Mike Tuis is a wildlife biologist specializing in wild cats, and he has been studying the ocelot for more than 30 years. Tuis is the coordinator for feline research with the Caesar Clayburgh Wildlife Research Institute at Texas A&M Kingsville and a respected authority on the ocelot. When he first began to search for the elusive cat in the early 1980s, many thought the ocelot had vanished from Texas. When, when I started the project, there were several biologists, wildlife biologists, that told me they didn't exist in Texas. And a few said that if they do exist, they're very rare and you'll never catch one. So I was pretty apprehensive at, at the beginning of the research. I got started in the research. Lynn Droy invited me from uh, the Weld of Wildlife Refuge to submit a proposal to the Fish and Wildlife Service um, in May of 1981. I remember that because uh, that was I just met my wife-to-be the week before, and I canceled our first date in order to finish the proposal on the deadline. Nearly one year later, Tuis captured and then released his first ocelot on Texas Independence Day, March 2nd, 1982, on the Corbett Ranch near Raymondville. I was, uh, it was, I was in heaven, uh, and I remember calling my uh, major professor, uh, Dr. Morris Hornacker at the University of Idaho, telling him that day I caught the first ocelot, and he said, that's nice, but what's the chances of catching the second one? It brought me back down to earth real fast. Five days later, Mike caught his second cat. And from that humble beginning, he eventually earned his doctorate and has become a world authority on the endangered ocelot. Either my students or I have, have captured over 200 ocelots over the years, and that includes ocelots in Mexico as well as in Texas. Typically in any one year, we may catch uh, uh, 8 to 11 ocelots would be a good year. 
While many advances have been made in the way ocelots are studied, from state-of-the-art genetic analysis to global positioning tracking technology, researchers still capture the cats the same way, with a box trap baited with a live chicken. We use box traps uh, to catch the, the cats, and they can't kill the chicken, the chicken stays alive. And we've gone on, I've, I've gone on to do research on 12 different cat species around the world using that same technique. Uh, using box traps with chickens uh, attached, and it's it's worked for clouded leopards and golden cats in Thailand, and and jaguarundis and margays in Mexico, as well as a variety of other cats. After live trapping an ocelot, researchers then sedate the cat with a quick injection. Once the cat is sedated, it receives a complete medical workup and is affixed with a tracking collar. Later, when fully recovered, the cat is released. On this day, field researchers Arturo Caso and Jennifer Korn from the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute are trapping on Frank Uturia's historic ranch north of Raymondville, established more than 150 years ago and home to approximately eight ocelots. Today was one of our lucky days, probably because you were, you were here. <laughs> are you fired up, Jennifer? I'm fired up. This is great. Two in one day is cool. pretty amazing. Tuas and his graduate students have been studying ocelots on the Uturia Ranch for many years. Some 25 years ago, ranch owner Frank Uturia established the first conservation easement for ocelots in the United States. That initial 500 acres has been expanded substantially. Since that time, I have increased the area for the ocelots to 2,600 acres with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and with Nature, uh, nature Conservancy. The, the fact that Mr. Uterio preserved this brush here is, is the reason I believe that the ocelot is going to continue to survive in Texas. When we told Mr. Uterio that he had ocelots here back in 1983, he, he grabbed onto that information and preserved the brush that still remained in this area. And because of that, he was able to save this population here. All my life, I've been a conservationist. Even my father was a conservationist. He never did allow a lot of excessive hunting on his property or overgraze the property, and it filtered down to me. Uturi is dedicated to doing all he can to save the extraordinary cats and is planning on providing even more sanctuary for them. I've been talking with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I've even increasing it further because I know today that if we don't do something to preserve this cat, he will certainly be gone within a short period of time. Fortunately, I have ranches surrounding me that have good habitat for the ocelots, one of them belonging to the Robert East Wildlife Foundation. And now that is a foundation to preserve wildlife, and we have ocelots there that transgress back and forth from my ranch to that ranch. As a matter of fact, the Clayburg Wildlife Institute trapped, I think it was 12 or 14 ocelots there. Two of them had worn out collars that were ocelots that were trapped on my ranch. One of the most important discoveries is the, the habitat that ocelots use. It's a very narrow uh, type of habitat. It's, it's very rare uh, uh, habitat. It's extremely dense mixed thorn shrub, the densest brush you could conceive. A rule of thumb is that you, you, you cannot walk through the brush much less see through the brush, very dense. And we have flown over South Texas two different times over the, over the years and found that less than 1% of South Texas has that kind of a, a habitat type. Uh, I consider this ranch uh, that belongs to Mr. Frank Turi as an example that we hope that other, land other landowners in Texas can follow. Mm -hmm. Because to conserve this kind of habitat is, is a key for ocelot conservation. The, the ocelots have a, a good future uh, because of the large ranches that are here in South Texas and the fact that they preserve the habitat uh, for, the, for the wildlife and hunting. More than 95% of the remaining wildlands in Texas are in the hands of private landowners. And the historic ranches of deep South Texas, such as the King, Kennedy, and Uturia, form what some call the last great habitat. Together, these sprawling ranches encompass more than a million and a half acres. Wild game, such as white-tailed deer, quail, and turkey, abound on these legendary ranches, and they are popular hunting destinations. Hunting helps pay the bills on these well-managed properties, and when hunting land is protected for game species, it also provides habitat 
for many other creatures such as the ocelot. Just southeast of the Yaturia Ranch and bordering the Laguna Madre is East Wildlife Foundation property. The East El Salas Ranch is home to the largest breeding population of wild ocelots in the United States, where 19 of the rare cats have been documented. Legendary South Texas rancher Robert East passed away in 2007 and bequeathed his vast holdings of some 200,000 acres to a nonprofit foundation. The East El Salas Ranch is one of six ranches comprising the East Wildlife Foundation, which are an enduring legacy for future generations of Texans. Wildlife and Research Manager Alfonso Ortega Sanchez is working with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and Cesar Clayberg Wildlife Research Institute to monitor the endangered ocelots and enhance their chances for survival. The, the mission of the East Wildlife Foundation is, is to support wildlife conservation and other public benefits of uh, private land stewardship and uh, and ranching in in South Texas. And the way that we accomplish this mission is by research, education, and outreach. So the objective of the foundation is basically to acquire the most up-to-date, reliable data, the information that we can on any particular species that we are studying so that we can make management decisions. And having basically the largest documented population uh, in, in the United States, uh, it's just a great opportunity for the East Wildlife Foundation, you know, to, to, to study a species like this and to actually make an impact that would eventually result in the, in the ultimate recovery of, of such an important species. In addition to private lands, Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge, less than 20 miles from the Rio Grande, is home to a small ocelot population of approximately 14 cats. Mitch Sternberg is lead ocelot biologist for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and is in charge of keeping tabs on the secretive felines. The only place in the United States where we have an ocelot population is actually in Texas. There are ocelots in Arizona, but there's never been a female documented in Arizona. While an occasional male ocelot wanders into Arizona from Mexico, South Texas is the only place in the nation with a documented breeding population. Currently we know of 41 ocelots in South Texas. Fish and Wildlife Service has a responsibility through the Endangered Species Act to form uh, some plans and uh, teams um, for most endangered species. For the ocelot, we have an ocelot recovery team. As part of the ocelot recovery team, researchers like Jody Mays have been live trapping ocelots okay. at Laguna Atascosa for some 30 years. As part of their thorough workup, researchers give the cats a permanent means of identification. Uh, we give it a pit tag, which is a, a subcutaneous tag that you inject under the skin. It'll have that for life. You can't see it, but if we ever capture that individual again, whether it has a radio collar or not, we'll be able to tell because of that pit tag. Biologists also attach radio tracking, or GPS collars, enabling them to monitor the cat's travel patterns and pinpoint areas that need to be protected. In addition to live trapping ocelots, researchers also rely on trail cameras that are very effective in documenting the presence of the secretive cats. They're critically important because we can use it as a non-invasive type method to establish where there are ocelots and how frequently those ocelots are passing. And then given left and right photos of ocelots, we can actually identify individuals. The pattern on ocelots is unique to the, that individual. Establishing the presence of cats and saving vital brushland is of primary importance, but there are several other challenges the ocelot recovery team is focusing on, including efforts to protect the cats as they wander from their preferred habitat of nearly impenetrable chaparral. And ocelots are the predator, the, the top predator for that type of habitat. While the secretive cats are perfectly adapted to their home in the remnants of thick thorn forest, they are vulnerable when moving from one isolated patch of brush to another. Number one uh, mortality factor for ocelots is actually vehicles. So wildlife crossings are critically important. There's a whole suite of science behind wildlife crossings and what works for different animals. And for cats in general, there's been some really good information about what will help them cross safely under roads. The one wildlife crossing that is installed in South Texas that could work for ocelots 
isn't immediately near the ocelot population, but there is all kinds of things using it. We have multiple bobcats crossing in there. And the plan is to build more of these vital crossings beneath roads in areas where ocelots are known to travel. Yes, we're working with Texas Department of Transportation right now on, a, on several highway projects to get wildlife crossings installed as part of the, the highway project, um, in particular on 106 that leads to Laguna, which has uh, been a sore spot for a lot of years for people that, that have to drive it. Uh, Texas Department of Transportation has plans to build up that road um, with that um, to maintain connectivity for wildlife, they have a responsibility to put in some kind of crossings uh, or wildlife mitigation uh, measures. Um, that will improve it for wildlife and also increase, increase the safety factor of that road for all the drivers. There'll be less wildlife crossing on the road. Mitch Sternberg carefully removes a rare ocelot from a live trap at Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. The cat has been sedated and Sternberg gently cradles the feline in his arms as he carries it to a nearby table. The young male weighs approximately 24 pounds and appears to be in excellent health. Biologists will thoroughly examine the cat and take a blood sample for later analysis. We caught our uh, first ocelot for the year. He's approximately a four-year-old male uh, ocelot, um, which by our standards he's just turned into an adult. Um, he covers a relatively small area of Laguna Atascosa so far, and uh, he's one that has had a radio collar on him before, and we've tracked him so we kind of know his, uh, his range. Assisting in the workup of the cat is Dr. Thomas DeMar, chief veterinarian from the Gladys Porter Zoo. If they catch an ocelot, I come out here and I try to help, at the, you know, drop everything and drive out here. We also do the, the disease survey. For the last six years, we run all of the blood work um, on the zoo's budget. So for every cat that is captured and has a full disease panel, we're spending, the zoo is spending $170, roughly. Um, and that is just laboratory costs to, to, to make it so we have a disease database. So if a new disease comes in or if something changes, we, we, have a, we have our finger on that pulse. Over the years, blood work has revealed a serious threat to this isolated population of South Texas ocelots. A marked decline in genetic diversity potentially making the cats more susceptible to disease and inherited abnormalities. The research that has come out of Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute about ocelot genetics over the year has both relied upon samples that they've taken uh, from populations as well as Fish and Wildlife Service. And we can see that historically um, up to about the 1950s the Texas uh, the diversity of the genetics of the Texas population was actually comparable to what's found in Mexico even today. Although uh, it has uh, declined quite a bit since then, um, our plans are to try and reinvigorate the genetics of the Texas ocelot by trying to make some connections with ocelots in Mexico. We, we've documented from 1985 to the present, 20, over a 25 year period of steady uh, genetic erosion in both populations and we've compared that with genetic samples we've obtained from the Smithsonian sample uh, from the Smithsonian Institution um, that were collected at the turn of the century around 1900 and, and the variability was much greater then compared to what it is now when you lose genetic diversity you you lose the future of the ocelot you lose the ability to adapt to future scenarios they won't have the genetic diversity to, to help them adapt to future environments. Uh, having genetic diversity also increases reproduction, survival. So we, so we need to increase the genetic diversity of these two populations. Historically, before extensive clearing for agriculture and urbanization, ocelots living in Texas and Mexico were linked by shared habitat. Fortunately, there are still thriving populations of ocelots on private lands south of the border, and biologists are optimistic about bringing the first cats to Texas in a year or two. Both countries in the future should work together, especially because there is the idea to translocate ocelots from Mexico to, to Texas. So I hope in the future this is going to happen. The future of translocation with Mexico is a good one because there's so many people interested and invested and passionate about doing it. The ocelot is perhaps the most charismatic spokes creature for vanishing South Texas wildlife. The beautiful and extremely rare cats represent the very essence of unique South Texas wildlife. 
and when critical habitat is preserved for the endangered cats, it benefits all wildlife, from colorful green jays to majestic white-tailed deer. This special brush that the ocelots uh, use on a daily basis is very diverse in, in, in the different brush species. There's 30, 35 species of brush that put out different seeds and berries, and that begets a, a broad diversity of other wildlife. The bird diversity is tremendous in, in these habitats that ocelots use, so the ocelot is important in, 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 in terms of conserving these habitats from the perspective of an umbrella species. Uh, the ocelot could be viewed as an umbrella species because if you protect the ocelot, all the other species under that umbrella of protection will benefit as well. Uh, the ocelot is certainly an umbrella species. If, if we succeed on uh, conserving the ocelot, we are conserving other species, including game species such as deer, quail, etc. The, the ocelot is, is like the canary in the mine. It's an indicator of the health of the land, the health of the habitat. If you're able to maintain that brush diversity and have a few ocelots on your property, then you're doing something right. The importance of private landowners is critical to ocelots' future. We can't buy enough habitat to save the ocelot. We, our computer modeling that, that my graduate students have done shows that, that we probably need at least 175 to 250 ocelots to have a, a sustainable population. To have that much habitat is, is very unlikely, so, so we have to uh, work hard at keeping the, the habitat that does exist and the ocelots that remains in, the, in those habitat tracks. I think with enough people that are invested in the ocelot as a part of our important wildlife heritage for South Texas, myself included, being a native to South Texas, I think the future for the ocelot is very good. I think with good partnerships that we have ongoing um, with both federal, state, county, and probably ultimately very importantly, our private landowners, uh, we can really make a difference and keep this cat here as part of our heritage for long term. I think that uh, it's in a precarious position right now. They're really uh, in a vulnerable and uh, kind of a dangerous position right now, but there's, we're, we've got the pieces in place that we need to, the pieces are falling into place that we need to be able to turn them around. I think we can turn them around. We've got partners that are interested in helping to do that. We've got uh, different projects that have started that we're working on that will actually could really, really turn them around. I can see, I can see that recovery goal that it's reachable. The past five years I've been very optimistic about ocelots and, and I can't say that was in the early years but it, the seeing efforts on, on the multiple fronts the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing a lot in terms of habitat restoration uh, with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife is, is helping us with the, the new ocelot project on the East Foundation and, and there are efforts uh, uh, by private individuals to help monitor cats on, on their properties, whereas that didn't exist uh, t even 10 years ago. Uh, I think, you know, the ocelot's a really special, unique animal. It's it's kind of a, I think of it as a, a characteristic of Texas, you know. it's It kind of represents the wildness that is Texas, and it's something that we should treasure, that we should try and keep here. They're so beautiful. They're a lovely little cat, and they just look like a little a leopard. And they're so, so attractive and so lovely that I think they need to be preserved. I hate to see the day come when the only place you can see an ocelot would be a zoo. Let's set aside some habitat for them and let them continue to exist in South Texas. While many South Texas landowners and federal, state, and private agencies are cooperating to protect the endangered ocelot, there is plenty the average citizen can also do to help. Jennifer Owen White is the Visitor Service Manager for the South Texas Refuge Complex, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working on several outreach efforts to help educate the public about their natural heritage and ocelots in particular. And everybody who lives and visits the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas can be very involved in saving ocelots by first being aware when they're driving, especially when they're driving at night, making sure when you're driving in areas where there's brush on one or either side of the road that you're paying attention, that you're driving slowly, and especially when you're driving in these areas where we know ocelots live. 
Second thing you can do is support organizations that do ocelot research and ocelot protection, like Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge and the Friends of Laguna Atascosa. The Friends Group for Laguna Atascosa does a lot of work in research and habitat conservation and restoration and in outreach and education. There is also a special annual visit to the Rio Grande Valley by a captive ocelot from the Cincinnati Zoo. And she is a popular attraction with school children and their parents. So that brings us to our next thing, which is our Ocelot Conservation Festival. It happens every single year, usually in the springtime, and it's a great chance for people to get out to learn more about ocelots. We also have our Viva the Ocelot Facebook page. Just by liking that page, you can see the latest photos of ocelots that were caught on our camera traps here, or you can find out about our ocelot recovery work or ocelot trapping and collaring. You can be a really big part of their conservation here on our refuge lands by adopting an ocelot. And you make a donation in the amount of $50 or $75 or maybe more if you're interested, and you get a symbolic adoption of either a single ocelot or an ocelot family. You get pictures of your ocelot and information about them, what's going on, and every time we catch them or find out more information about them here in the refuge, you'll find out about that as well. And there is another way to show support for saving South Texas ocelots that the general public can participate in. When it's time for your license plate renewal or your registration renewal, take a look and see if there's an ocelot conservation license plate. And if there is, go ahead and get one because you're doing a great thing to give money towards ocelots as well as spread the word about ocelots here in South Texas. While it is encouraging to see the cooperative efforts of federal and state agencies, landowners, and private citizens all working toward saving this iconic cat, the exponential population growth in the region and the continued fragmentation of native habitat threaten the existence of the endangered ocelot. The ocelot is on the verge of vanishing from its last precarious foothold in the United States. Whether this fragile and isolated population is able to survive in its final redoubt in the thorny chaparral of southernmost Texas remains to be seen. Throughout the centuries, they have somehow managed to survive prolonged droughts, freezing winters, and other natural perils. We have forced the phantom cat to the edge of extinction in the United States, and if the wild ocelot becomes merely a ghost, we will have lost an irreplaceable essence of our natural heritage. I'm often asked what, why is it important that, that we keep the last ocelots here. And, and when you think about it, an ocelot is as beautiful as, as a masterpiece. It's, it's as important as a Mona Lisa or any other human created masterpiece. It can't be reproduced. And, and for us to lose ocelots in Texas, uh, we'd be losing uh, just another important piece of that biological diversity that makes Texas so great.